Howdy folks, quick question for you. Let's say you wanted a three row SUV crossover and you wanted it to be a plug-in hybrid. How many choices do you have in the United States? Not many. So Mazda, who recently brought us the outstanding Mazda CX-90 said, hey, we're gonna build one that has a plug. And I say, they did it because they had to. Let's have a look at this. Now, first of all, as I said, the CX-90 is one of my favorite crossover three-row SUVs that are out there, especially the Turbo S. It's phenomenal. They all look pretty much the same though, all of them, which is cool because even if you get the base model, which is a hell of a lot cheaper than this, and we'll get to the price at the end, you still get what I think is a very sexy looking SUV crossover. And the reason why, part of it, Look at this hood. Back in the day, back when vehicles were mostly, you know, front engine, rear drive, <laughs> they had long, beautiful hoods. Nowadays, you'll notice they're stubby by comparison. Well, the reason why is because this vehicle was designed to hold a inline or straight six. Unfortunately, this doesn't have that. But on top of that, this has what I think is a very restrained front end. Everybody's going for the massive grill, right? Have you seen Lexus or even Toyota products? Even some stuff that's coming out from American makers and German especially, oh my God, BMW. This is restrained and it's done in such a way to wear very classy little strip of chrome here and there, not too much, not too little. But then look at the side of this thing. Massive wheelbase, huge wheelbase. That long wheelbase to me kind of harks back to that feeling of a performance wagon. I know it's not that cool to Americans, but to Europeans and actually a lot of other people other than Americans, performance wagons were kind of cool. That's what this kind of looks like to me, but just lifted. Unfortunately, for those of you who live in snow country like I do, not that high off the ground, less than nine inches. Check this out. Look how big this is. That is is your EV thing. And we will talk about the EV uh, plug in a second. Um, da -da, there you go. Uh, by the way, notice that there's a cap down here for fast charger. Yeah, it doesn't fast charge. Anyway, we'll talk about that in a minute, but look how big this is. That's huge. Quickly to the back. Once again, restrained. I really do like the design of this. And thank you Mazda for not putting on fake exhaust tips or anything like that. Nice little piece of chrome. I'm a bit of a Mazda fanboy when it comes to design, and I do like what they did here, and I think it's better looking than the CX-9, which essentially is the vehicle it replaced. All right, let's pop this baby open. <laughs> this is kind of deceptive. Um, and that's because this is similar to the setup that is inside the straight six, and you would need this rather lengthy compartment here to hold that. But in this case, and I think it will let me open it, um, Oh wait, here we go. You unlock it here and you unlock it there. Wait a minute, <laughs> where are the other two cylinders? <laughs> That's right. Um, this is a four cylinder, 2.5 liter, and it is hooked up to an electric hybrid system. So essentially what we're talking about here, now it's not that much down on power compared to the Turbo S, but it is by comparison down. It has 323 horsepower combined and 369 pound-feet, once again, combined. In between the engine and the transmission, they sandwich an electric motor in there. And that works in multiple ways. Essentially, it makes the vehicle obviously more powerful than it would with a naturally aspirated four-cylinder engine, but it also works to allow for better gas mileage. So like when you're speeding up, it'll add power to the vehicle electrically to take stress off the engine to make for better fuel mileage. Now, it's hooked up to an eight-speed automatic transmission, the same automatic transmission that basically goes through the six-cylinder version of this vehicle. And with this, and I have the sticker here, this vehicle is capable of getting up to 56 MPGE. That's right. However, if you only run it like a regular four cylinder and you do not use the battery, right? Which you can do, you're only gonna get 25 MPG, which essentially, and that's combined, is the same as 
the six cylinder. So essentially, if you run it like a hybrid, yeah, you're gonna get really good mileage. If you run it like a regular gas engine, then it's really no different or not that much different than the six cylinders. That is interesting to me because that's where things start to change with this vehicle. And it all comes down to drivability. Oh, and one final thing, this tows 3,500 pounds. However, you can tow 5,000 pounds if you get the six cylinder. Alrighty, so I was telling you about this huge charger door for this little tiny. Yep, that's a CCS, my friends. Yep, they haven't hooked up anything for the NACS system. Um, the jury's still out on when and if Mazda will actually do that with this vehicle. A couple things with this. First of all, you're powering a 17.8 kilowatt hour battery. And that battery, you're not fully using all its energy. Really, you're getting, I don't know, like 15 kilowatt hour battery out of this because it always has to be at a 20% charge so you never lose power in the vehicle. So you never have a deficit if you overuse the battery like some PHEVs do, right? So keep that in mind. Also, no quick charger. Yeah, it's got a little stint here, but you can't pull that out. They glued it in real tight. So you can use uh, level two. Use just a regular, you know, 110. This thing's gonna take hours, right? pretty much like six or so hours, give or take. But if you plug it in pretty much at empty or it's equivalent of empty and you use level two, it's a little over two hours to give you a full charge. The good news is according to this lovely paper, the EPA says you can go up to 26 miles on an electric charge alone. That means using electricity alone. And the cool part about that, probably my favorite part of this vehicle is the fact that you can do that at any speed. You can do it on the highway, you could do it driving on the street, all with electricity. So if you put your foot down, it's still electricity, provided that you have enough power in the battery. All right, let's start her up. No noise because hybrid. Okay, but this, now check it out. When I hit this, check out what happens. The reason why it starts is because now I'm telling the vehicle to charge the battery that I want it to run without use of the battery. That is great if you wanna charge the thing up, especially in certain types of traffic situations, going down the highway or whatever, and you wanna get a little bit more juice out of the battery. Once again, it will not discharge itself. Wanted to show you this as well, because this is something I'm not a, that big of a fan of, the eight-speed automatic transmission gear select. Now see, it's in park right now. In order to get it to drive or to go to reverse, put the button here, and then you gotta shift it over to the right. There's neutral and there's drive. So in other words, park over, over to go into the drive modes. I'm being a little over dramatic about it, moving my wrist around a lot. It's really not much, right? It's only like, you know, an inch, but it does make a difference. All right, so let's go into drive. Let's move this bad boy. Turning radius, by the way, is horrendous. <laughs> that long wheelbase, it compromises one thing for sure. Oh, actually two things. If you took it off road, your breakover angle is going to be horrendous as well. But Tommy actually found that this thing did all right off-road despite the fact that it didn't have really that much ground clearance. Once again, I do recommend his video. It was quite good. Go to alttfl.com for that. Now, what about this vehicle? It's a hybrid, so it can run on electricity because it's a plug-in hybrid. Now, we've already done some testing with the boys and they've confirmed that it can get around 25, 26 miles in all electric mode. Performance. Uh, when I go into a corner with this, I can feel that extra weight. I know, I know I'm calling the kettle black, but it's simply heavier. And then in addition, it's as if the weight transfer of adding the battery and extra components, including the electric motor and all the other components that are needed to make this thing into a hybrid, um, it seems like it's taken that excellent balance and sort of changed it. So that part is a little upsetting to me, only from a performance standpoint. Driving this thing every day, you would not be able to tell the difference, especially if you were someone who didn't really care about performance. Now, there is something else, and that is this, aside from shifting it, which is kind of weird, you get used to it. Um, 
the eight-speed automatic transmission in this does not respond the same way that it does in the other two powertrains. It seems a little squiffy, a little weird. Okay, so here's an example. I'm just gonna put this thing in performance mode. So that's over here, remember that button? And you make it all red and everything turns red. Okay, I'm in sport mode. Now I'm gonna put my foot down. Okay, it moves really fast by the way but the gear shifts with the turbo in sport mode they click off so much faster at least that's how it feels to me like bing 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 you know what I mean like it's it's more deliberate it's more urgent in this one not so much and here is another part now I'm gonna put this into normal mode and in normal mode it feels like it coasts a little bit further which makes sense because this is trying to make the most out of the mileage but there's kind of a disconnect right so I accelerate and then you feel it kind of kick in I accelerate then you feel the gear go you know it's it's interesting that it has this type of deliberate slow response once again for efficiency okay with all that being said is it terrible no not at all not at all I just think that Mazda built this because they're like well we kind of have to build a hybrid you know we need our score to improve we don't really have a dedicated electric car that's viable in the United States once again I said that's viable so this is as close as they can get for now because bear in mind you know electrification is coming so this is their first step and I think it's a very good first step it's a hell of a lot better than that other vehicle that should remain nameless and did not do particularly well um, this has a wonderful design it has a lot of power, it's very efficient, it's extremely comfortable, it has a firm Mazda feel to it, but at the same time, it has plenty of give. You'll put your kids to sleep in no time in this car, and at the same time, if you really had to throw it around a corner, it can do it. But if you want to save some dough, and you want to have cars that handle better and are more rewarding, by the way, steering's excellent, then I do recommend getting the other two, or looking at the other two, and you'll save a ton of dough. All right, you guys ready? gonna pop open this puppy because one of the most important things about buying a vehicle like this is the fact that you have lots of space you need that when you have rugrats that are going to sit in the third row you're gonna need that if you have bicycles and animals and all the other things that come with being a parent believe me I've gone there before um, okay so how much space is here well first of all let's put down one of these seats here that's how you do it and it's pretty easy, by the way. Yeah, I know you could push a button on some of these other vehicles, but this isn't so bad. Here we go, pull this one down too. Okay, now, if you buy the uh, base model, not this, but the base model of the regular six cylinder, not the Turbo S, I believe you can get a bench seat, but this one comes with cap and seats on the second row. Meaning, of course, you got two in the front, two here, and then you can have, I believe, up to three in the back, meaning that seven seats. Um, so I guess eight seats is your maximum. And that's kind of strange to me because I could have sworn I saw one of these where they only had room for two. All right, so how much space is here? Now, have a look, by the way. You have USB-C on both sides. You have cup holders in the doors and everything else. You can get up to 74.2 cubic feet of cargo space with all the seats down. Behind the second row, that's these right here, so this space right here, it's 40 cubic feet. And if I pull these up, which is relatively easy to do, which is a good thing, you have a maximum of, I believe it's, yeah, 14.9 cubic feet. And then you have this, aha! Looky here, nice little Mazda Blue plug. Yeah, you know that some companies actually charge you to put these in the vehicle. In other words, they don't come necessarily with a charger. This one does, which is great. Um, you do have all the, this is something I like too, because you have the AC right on this side and on this side. That is something that you don't see in very many PHEVs or actually any crossovers that I know of. Usually it's only on one side or the other. So that is kind of cool. But let's have a look at the interior because I think that is the piece de resistance of this vehicle. Man, Mazda's been getting these interiors right in so many of their vehicles. Even the base model version of this has a pretty decent looking interior. 
but this <sighs> Napa leather. Bear in mind, we are talking top trim here. And normally I'm not one for patterns that look even remotely like carbon fiber, but this isn't too bad. Obviously, all the components here built in Japan. And here's the part that I love the most. Real push buttons. Real buttons all the way across. That's right, suckas. Because in so many vehicles, they have buttons that are integrated with the screen or a screen or this is one panel that you're hitting and you smear your spilt coffee all over it and then it's useless or you have it on the steering wheel where you don't have real buttons i am talking about you volkswagen because you haven't fixed everything yet and these buttons here these toggles they're nice can you hear that click click, click. i love it thank you now these screens are both 12.3 inch i fire this puppy up right now. All right, remember it's a hybrid, so it's not going to be starting. And of course the door is making a ton of noise. <laughs> there we go, okay. So on the 12.3 inch screen that's in front of us, you have some very simple information. First of all, you have something very revealing about the MPG on this vehicle, which has been driven in a mix of city and highway driving. 32.5 is what we're currently averaging. And according to this, we're getting 2.3 miles per kilowatt hour. It's okay. Um, this is very simple. As you're driving down the road, the needle will go up as you're going from charge to power. And so obviously you want to charge as often as possible to put juice back in the battery. In order to do that, a couple very simple things you can do. Now, this is the MI Drive, okay? And you can go, if you look at the screen here, from sport, which makes everything red and sporty, see that, sport, to normal, which is boring. Um, then you have EV. Now, as long as you have enough battery, you can run it in EV mode. It will not let you go below 20%, even though it says you're out of juice, it just, it will stop. Once again, it has to keep power going. And then there's an off-road mode too. Now, if you look, you can go to alltfl.com, uh, Tommy did a really comprehensive drive off-road in one of these. Now that one was the turbo and you know, they are a little bit different. Here's one of the big differences has nothing to do with the drivetrain in terms of the actual transmission, you know, off-road mode and all that stuff. It has to do with weight. So that one weighs around 300 pounds less than this. This is definitely the heaviest of them all. Big battery, well, fairly big battery all the hybrid components in it as well. If you get the base model, this weighs a good 500 plus pounds more. Keep that in mind. It actually does make a difference in terms of driving dynamics. But going back to Tommy, he took one of these off-road and put it on the roller test and it did really, really well. Tom, uh, I mean, between you and me, Tommy is pretty harsh on these vehicles when he does the roller test. It's a tough test. This vehicle, its brother, did remarkably well, and I would wager that this will do just as well, because once again, essentially the same type of traction control system. Okay, a couple more things before we get out of here. Now, you do have this lovely stitching that I wanted to point out here, and I love the way that Mazda not only did this with the stitching going along here, look at that, but they incorporated this nice pewter finish going all the way across. It's simple, it's elegant, it looks way better in different colors. By the way, the black, yeah, it's pretty good, but I've seen it in other, like a tan color. Oh, it looks exquisite. And I like the fact that everything is a soft touch material. Everything feels premium. This is akin to anything that the Germans build, you know, within reason, um, all around. And what I do like to do is just re reach all over the place and touch materials. And no matter where I put my paws, everything feels like it's built properly. And thank you, Mazda, for that. They really did make this interior high, high quality. And here's the best part. The other seats, they're bent. Well, I would say they're damn comfortable as well. Observe door. Now it does look pretty big, but that's a good thing. Problem! That is like a garage door opening, my friends. How many SUVs and crossovers for mamas and dadas do not open enough? Like simpler, you know, you're pulling up a little stroller and you want to get Junior into the car. Having a door open this much is so much easier for seat placement and for putting a guy with a big butt like me into a vehicle like this. 
Observe. Big door opening. Oh, wow. I get my beer belly around the corner and I can fit. Now, plenty of space, actually. I have headroom. If I had Romans to pay on, I probably would touch the ceiling just a little bit, but it's not too bad. Uh, plenty of room for me. I'm 6'1", and I'm sitting behind myself. My feet, they fit under the seat. That's great. And if you look right over here, ready? I look over here. Pull this up. Boom! Mom, Dad, look at that. I could hold my, my drinks in there and flip it down. I love little things like that because most likely it won't get used, but a bored kid sitting here will play with that for hours on end. Okay. Now, over here, we have USB-Cs, two of them, and we have heating air conditioning controls for the second row and heated rear seats. That's very cool as well on this model. And then you look over here, and we have two very large openings for bottles or drinks, and then, of course, a little square one back there, which is perfect for Tommy's juice box. And then finally, shades. But you know what the most important part about this second row is? I really appreciate the fact that automakers, certain ones, go out of their way to make the back row, this second row, I mean, as comfortable as the front seats. These seats are very comfortable. You have all this nice material around you. You still have the stitching here, and you have soft touch materials. So the second row feels high quality. I do appreciate that. But the most important question, of course, is, this is a three row vehicle. How will the fat guy fit in the third row? Now, a couple things I wanted to point out. Now, first of all, if you pull this up, the seat folds flat. Uh, this is great if you have lumber, but not so much if you have to get into the back seat. That is handled by this handle right here. See that? You pull it and it slides forward and that's it. <laughs> that's all it does. I really wish it was like the Nissan uh, Pathfinder, which has that seat that kind of jackknifes a little bit on the cushion and pulls up a little bit further. That would make it a little easier for me to get in and get out. But with that being said, here we go. I gotta be honest with you. Um, not horrible, but as third rows go, it's relatively spacious, but I say that if I were a small person, because now watch. Here we go. Yeah, so this is all the way, well, nearly all the way back, and there's no way I could comfortably sit back here with my feet. Yeah, because I can't put my feet underneath, right? So I'd have to put my foot out over here. Whew. And I hope I'm not like some airline people who suck, who take their shoes off while the plane is flying, making other people suffer. Uh, not a ton of headroom. If I put my head back, then I definitely rub into the ceiling. Cup holders on both sides, USB-C on both sides. And uh, I'm not seeing, oh, oh, the vent, they're there. They're down here. If you look in the corner, right here where my thumb is, that's where the vent is. Not the best place for that. Poor placement. And as I said, the roof, <laughs> it comes in a little bit. Fortunately, I slouch. All right, here's the question. How much? I'll tell you in just a second, but first of all, let me explain a couple things. First of all, some of you are saying, well, what about the Toyota Highlander, the Grand Highlander, right? The big one, which is a hybrid option. Yeah, that would compete with this, but it doesn't. Why? Because it's not a plug-in. There are only a handful of plug-in hybrids with three rows of seats that are even remotely close to this vehicle. So that would consist of the BMW X5, the X-Drive 45E that starts at 67, he's all rounded. Uh, Kia Sorento, PHEV, at 52,000. Uh, Lincoln Aviator at 72,000. Mitsubishi Outlander, PHEV, at 42,000. And the vehicle that I think really competes against this, the Volvo XC90 Recharge at $73,000. Why are those prices important? Because, whew, this one's $58,920. Getting really close to $60,000. Is it worth it? Okay, so there's that whole thing about you're paying more to get a hybrid to save money. Yeah. 
No, I, I wouldn't agree with that. If you're buying a Mazda, you're buying a Mazda for the experience of the drive. That's kind of the bottom line. And this vehicle, because of its compromised driving dynamics, compared to its brethren, compared to the other six cylinder versions, isn't great. It's okay. It's still a hybrid. It's still a plug-in hybrid. It does its job, but it's pricey. Now you can get one of these at $49,945. Good luck finding one of those. If you're going, and I see we have here actually a list of them. So this is preferred, the premium and the premium plus, and this is the premium plus. That means it has the upgraded 21 inch wheels and all the cool paint and all that other stuff. By the way, they call this paint uh, rhodium white primer. No, premium, <laughs> I'm kidding about the primer. Doesn't that sound like riders from Rohan? Oh, okay. So, is it worth it? As I said, I don't really think it is, unless you get the less expensive versions of it. I don't really see a lot of savings. However, in certain states, you can get some kickback in terms of tax credit for having a plug-in hybrid. So you'll have to check your local state to see whether or not it's eligible for that. And if that's the case, it may actually make a little bit more sense. But as it stands, if you're going to get one of these, I highly recommend the Turbo S or even the base model, which I still think is a stellar vehicle, a lot of fun to drive. This one is not quite as fun, but it's still decent. And I gotta tell you, that interior, mwah. The exterior, double mwah. So there you go, a lot of kissing. Thanks for joining me, I'll see you next time.